Good evening, church. So, the sermon I'm giving today is Beauty and the Beast. True story. Let's start with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for bringing us here today on this beautiful evening. Please help the words that come out of my mouth to be your words. And please let them bless all the people who are here today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the popular children's story, Beauty and the Beast, presents the fantastic story of a prince, because of his spell, was turned into a monster. His enchantment would only end when someone would love him as he was. That finally happened when a cute villager came to his castle to look for her lost father. The story ends when the spell is broken and the young people get married and are very happy, as all stories end. Revelation presents us with an impressive story, the true story of Beauty and the Beast. In this story, the original beast reaches its state not because of his spell, but as a result of disobedience to God, and does not fall in love with the protagonist, but pursues her for selfish purposes. The ending is happy, not because there is marriage, but because beauty triumphs over the beast. Please join me in Revelation chapter 12, and let's read the first three verses. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his head. In Revelation chapter 12, two symbols stand out, the woman and the dragon. It is interesting to see that both the woman and the dragon are mentioned eight times throughout the entire chapter. Remember who the dragon is? In our previous message, we identified him as Satan, the ancient serpent, Revelation 12.9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I would like you to understand that Satan works through gadgets. Therefore, the dragon is a symbol of all power that opposes God's work and makes war against him. But what does the woman symbolize? Before answering this question, let me quickly show you a simple rule of biblical interpretation that will help you understand the book of Revelation. Are you ready? This rule says, the Bible is its own interpreter. To interpret the Bible, the only thing you need is the Bible itself. So it explains itself. Similarly, to understand the prophetic symbols, all they have to do is research the Bible itself. With this in mind, I invite you to read a few verses that explain the symbol of the woman. Ephesians 5, 25-26. These, these verses read, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water by the word. And now let's read 2 Corinthians 11, 2. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. A pure woman, as it appears in Revelation 12, represents God's people or the true church. Therefore, the drama we see in this chapter is Satan's war against God's people or the church. The church, does Revelation speak of the true church? That's right. And I think it is one of the, I think it is the, of the utmost importance to stop here as to study the subject of the church as presented in the Bible and especially in the book of Revelation. When we talk about the church, the first thing we must ask ourselves is, does God have a church on earth? 
The answer to this question is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. I have told you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did you notice it? God has a church, and he calls it my church. But in the world today, there are more than 30,000 Christian denominations, and they all claim to be the church of God. How can we know which one is true? Revelation 12 makes at least five characteristics that make it possible to identify the true church. Do you follow me? Let's evaluate each of these features separately. Feature 1. The true church believes in the gospel. Revelation 12.1 presents the woman as clothed with the sun. What does this mean? Remember the rule of biblical interpretation? The Bible is its own interpreter. Let us turn to Malachi 4.2. You there say amen? Oh, yeah. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise, with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. The true church accepts that salvation is solely and exclusively by grace. Ephesians 2 5 to 8. It also believes that forgiveness is received not by good work, but by faith. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Characteristic 2. The true church lives the hope of the second advent. Revelation 12.2 presents the woman with labor pains and being in anguish of childbirth. Similarly, Matthew 24.8 evokes the same image of the pains of childbirth to speak of the signs that announce the soon return of Jesus Christ. That is, that the pains of childbirth speak of the prompt appearance of the child. In other words, the true church lives in, in the expectant waiting for its Savior. Characteristic number three, the true church is obedient to the commandments of God. Revelation 12.17 says that the offspring of the woman are characterized by keeping the, God, keeping the commandments of God. The true church is obedient to God's commandments. But to which commandments? To the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. Let us turn there. And God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to the thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the, of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, 
nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Amen. Characteristic number four. The true church believes in the spiritual gifts, especially in the gift of prophecy. In the same verse, in the same verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12, we are told that the true church has the testimony of Jesus. Additionally, in Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, or the gift of prophecy. Number five. The true church is a triumphant church. The woman in Revelation 12 has a crown of 12 stars, Revelation 12.1. And the crown in the Bible is a symbol of victory, Revelation 2.10 and 2 Timothy 4.8. Let's turn to Revelation 2.10 first. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. Dear, young, dear men and women, the Seventh-day Adventist Church possesses the characteristics that identify the true people of God. As a church, we believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that outside of it there is no salvation. The Adventist denomination testifies to the hope that we have the, in the advent of Jesus Christ a second time. We hold the Ten Commandments remain in full force and are a test of the Christian character. We believe in the spirit of in the gift of prophecy and that it was manifested in the ministry of Mrs. Ellen G. White. Her writings are a source of counsel, instruction, and correction for the church, and they clearly state the Bible is a standard by which all teaching and all experience must be evaluated. We trust in Christ we trust that in Christ we are more than conquerors, and that thanks to his life, death and resurrection victory has been assured. Revelation 12.17 clearly says that the dragon is filled with anger against the church. That is, that Satan will seek by all means to destroy God's people. But we should not fear, because Jesus Christ is the keeper of the church, and he has never lost a battle. Dear men and women, God has a church that believes in Jesus as its only Savior and lives obediently to his principles. Some time ago, in a, different, in a church in one of our conferences, a young woman came to one of our congregations who for years has been struggling with depression and anxiety. She had very few friends and spent most of her free time locked in her apartment. She didn't go out anywhere except to work and to the nearest shop to buy beer and cigarettes. Her life, as she herself recounts, had no meaning and or no purpose. Solitude was her only company. One day, she received an through a co-worker, the invitation to attend one of our church services. At first, she made some excuses, but her colleague's insistence was so great that she agreed to visit the church only once to try. Finally, she attended the Sabbath service and spent much of the day sharing with us. She enjoyed a delicious lunch, and in the afternoon, she went out with a group of believers to deliver food to people in need. In her own words, that day was very special. She had not really enjoyed such a welcoming atmosphere before, and, she, and so she did return the following week. This time, the young people invited her to a social activity in one of their homes. She was willing to go and realized that Christians enjoy life in a healthy way, without alcohol or drugs. She said, I couldn't believe what was going on, and felt accepted and valued. Weekly, she received text messages with motivating verses from the Bible. A group of sisters included her in a special prayer line. She had no time to feel alone. Six months after her first visit, she asked to be baptized. Before her, ba before her baptism, she told her testimony and said that the love shown to her by the children, the youth, and adults had helped her overcome her loneliness. Today, as she is completely free, she abandoned the vices of tobacco and alcohol 
but above all things, she enjoys a special relationship with God and with others. Amen. If you're not yet part of the church, I invite you to join as soon as possible. Amen.